lesson is taken from Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That is the end of the lesson. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex, for bringing our reading this morning. Why don't we pray together as we start today? Lord, thank you for your word. And we just recognise at the outset that this is your word, inspired by you, given to us to, to lead and guide us in the way of life, to know everything we need to about you, about ourselves and what's necessary to have a relationship with you. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and minds, give us insight and understanding into your word that we might live transformed lives because of it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Guys, welcome, especially if you've never joined St. Peter's Notting Hill before. Um, it's great that you're here. And today you join us at an exciting moment because we're kickstarting a brand new series today, five part series uh, in light of Easter. You know, so often we get to Easter, which was, of course, a couple of Sundays ago, and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, go woo, and then we sort of move on almost too quickly. But the church, in its wisdom, uh, centuries ago, well, and because that's what's outlined in the word of God, um, laid down the Eastertide festival or feast, if you like, uh, that was to last 50 days until the day of Pentecost. All these big things coming up in the life of the church. And we are in the midst of that 50 days uh, called Eastertide, um, where we just thought it would be good to dwell a bit longer um, on the message of Easter, on the message of resurrection, which is our bread and butter as Christians and for Christianity, it is the heartbeat of what it's all about, that Jesus is alive. So we're kickstarting today a new series called Resurrection. Everything has changed because the resurrection, the life of Jesus changes everything. We want it to be really practical. So we're going to be looking at things like worry, the difference it makes to our mental health and the things uh, everyone is wrestling, aren't they? There's so much anxiety and worry in the world today. Well, Jesus has got things to say to that. And the resurrection of Jesus impacts that. We're going to be looking at worry. We're, we're going to be looking at our finances, the difference the resurrection of Jesus makes to how we should see money, how we should use uh, money. We're going to be uh, looking in two weeks time. I'm looking at aging. Have you ever heard a talk on aging, growing old, growing old gracefully and the difference that r the resurrection and uh, the future life of the Christian makes to that? I know I've never heard one. I've certainly never given one. So tune in in two weeks time to learn about how we can deal with the fact that we all reach a point where instead of increasing uh, into our prime, we are on the downslope and we are coming down the other side. And I know I've reached that point. So hopefully it will be helpful for you. <clears throat> but we want this to be a really um, practical s series. Am I OK, Joe? You can hear me OK? Joe? The picture's a bit laggy. That's what we need to hear. Sorry, folks. I can see myself being a bit laggy on video. But that's the series we're kicking off. And today... I want to focus on perhaps the most important impact that the resurrection Easter has on each of our lives, which is dealing with death or more specifically for each one of us, dealing with the fear of death. This is the verse really we're focusing on today from Hebrews 2 verse um, 
15. It says that Jesus came to break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, you heard Alex and I mentioned at the start of this um, uh, service that we both watched Prince Philip's funeral today. Maybe you watched um, it too. Maybe just this last week, you've been looking back at Prince Philip, uh, Philip's life in a couple of those documentaries that have been on TV. I know uh, Kirsty and I watched one the other day about his life of service with the Queen and we were just moved to tears at the end of it, just realising the loss that the Queen faces and the loss that we as a nation face. Um, these are sad times, challenging times uh, that we live in. Um, and it's been a challenging year, hasn't it, where we've not been able to pick up a newspaper, turn on the news without seeing something about covid the sickness, um, the death st statistics, there's so much of it around in the air, in the atmosphere, and so much uncertainty. And as I reflected um, the week, just day or two after Prince Philip died, I was trying to make sense, reflect on, Lord, what are you doing at this time? Because ultimately God is in control, isn't he, of this universe, of this world, and of your life, my life, all of our lives. So for some reason, God in his wisdom chose to take Prince Philip at the time that he did. And I just find it extraordinary that God chose to take Prince Philip um, on the back of a year where we have faced so much uncertainty, so much anxiety, so much death and grief, that if you'll pardon the pun, God chose to crown that year with the passing of one of our nation's most well-known um, and well-respected uh, individuals, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip himself, going the way of all flesh and God choosing before we head out of lockdown, before June the 21st, you know, when everyone would be outside and people would be distracted and they'd be filling their lives with other things. Um, God in his wisdom, whilst we're still in lockdown, still in this extraordinary time, still only allowed funerals of 15 people, extraordinary or is it 30 i can't quite remember but god chose to take prince philip at that moment and chose to grab our nation's attention and the attention of the wider world and focus it on the reality that every human being will face that of our mortality that of our unavoidable death and there on camera for the world to see for millions viewing online or on TV, we saw the coffin of Prince Philip sort of lying in state during that service, camera angles often focusing on it. And none of us can get away, none of us yesterday or in general can get away from the fact that that points forward to our destiny too, to our future, that we too will die. We too will end up in a coffin, in a box, and we will go to meet our maker. And I just find it amazing that God in his wisdom uh, chose to um, take Prince Philip in the week following Easter, just a few days after Easter Sunday, when we had remembered the resurrection of Jesus, the hope we have, that death really is defeated. And it's in the light of Easter that we're uh, looking and taking part in Prince Philip's funeral yesterday and just appreciating afresh our humility as human beings and the words that appear in the funeral service that came from God to Adam when death entered the world. In the book of Genesis, Genesis 3, God said, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. And I think it's just an amazing witness that yesterday we uh, got to be part of a deeply Christian service for a man recognising and looking back at the life of a man who um, was recognised as a committed uh, man of faith, a committed Christian. And as part of that service, which he would picked out every piece of music, every prayer, every reading, Prince Philip had picked out ahead of time. And one of the readings he picked out was, of course, Jesus visiting Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. You might remember uh, Jesus got there a bit late, deliberately, 
Lazarus had passed away and he was in the tomb. He'd been dead three days. And um, Martha's like, Lord, if you'd only got here earlier, he would have been all right. In other words, where were you? Why did you let him die? But Jesus knew what he was doing. It was all for God's glory. And Jesus said these words to um, Martha and he says them to us. And we heard them said yesterday. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Let me ask you a, a very profound and personal question this morning. It's a question I've never asked, I don't think, in a sermon ever before. But how do you feel about dying? How do you feel about your own death? I wonder what feelings come up. I wonder what thoughts um, arise in your hearts or minds. Perhaps you're like most of the world, most of society, and just uh, you ignore it. You don't like to think about it. I mean, none of us really do, do we? You know, so you kick the can down the road. You sort of think, oh, I'll live forever and you're fine. And we sort of like, uh, yeah, we, we kid ourselves or we block it out. But my aim is that by the end of this talk, that you and all of us should be able to, like St. Paul says um, in the New Testament, you should be able to embrace it. Paul said this, he described his own life. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or in the words I'm reminded of my, my friend Simon Gilbo, who was a missionary in Burundi in Africa, the heart of Africa for years and years. And he was there during a time of serious unrest, um, civil war. And he was driving on a motorbike going from one location to another with uh, his local Burundian friend, co-missionary, um, on the back of the bike. And they could hear gunshots going off. They could hear mortars, grenades exploding. And they just realized how risky it was and that any moment they might get hit. They might get killed. And um, from behind, his friend just uh, whis whispered. I mean, I think he shouted because it was probably pretty noisy on the motorbike. But in his ear, he said, Simon. You know, we are invincible until God calls us home. That is the Christian view, the Christian vision we all can have of death, even our own death. Then when we come to trust in God, a God who loves us, a God who is our heavenly father, we can trust that he holds and ordains all the days of our lives and that only he will call us home when he's ready. But that's not the way of the world, is it? That's not what we see going on in our society. On the whole, people and society uh, is terrified of dying, terrified of death. They don't know how to handle it. They've got no answer to it. They've got nothing to say to it. So the world tends to block it out or imagine it's, it's not there. I remember hearing of a hospital some years ago that spoke of death in the hospital. They, they coined the term negative patient care outcome. It is a bit negative, isn't it? I mean, they died. Uh, whatever you want to call it, people die. I, I met a young woman the other day in her mid-twenties who came to film me, asked me about portable priest stuff for a news report she was wanting to put out um, to some producers. And she opened up about how uh, a cousin of hers, who I know is a Christian, but about herself, she opened up that she was terrified of dying. And isn't that true for so many, so many people we know, perhaps true for you today. It's what our verse in Hebrews speaks of. Jesus coming to free those who all their lives lived under the slavery of the fear of death. And that's natural if, if we're honest, isn't it? Because um, if you've got no answer to it, then you're going to fear. We fear what we don't know or understand, don't we? But. How can we live truly free lives if we don't have an answer to human, humanity's biggest question? How can we live free lives 
if we if we don't know what happens when we die or don't know how to go and meet that moment, it'll always be overshadowing us. Uh, add to that the fact that we don't know when we'll die. I mean, you know, hands up, who, who fancies another 50 years? I'm going to be going strong. I want to hit 99 like uh, Prince Philip or go a couple of months longer. I want to make the big 100, bring up the century. It might be another 50 years. It might just be another five years that we've got. Or it might be tomorrow. We just don't know. I mean, we are one moment, one heartbeat away from stepping into eternity. Just take, take your hand and put it on your heart just now. Everyone doing that? Hands on hearts. Can you feel your heart beating? Well, this is how fragile life is, OK? Because um, you can take your hand off now. But some interesting statistics. The average heart beats 80 times a minute, which means your heart beats 4,800 times per hour or 115,200 times a day. Over the course of a year, your heart would beat about 42,048,000 times. And if you live to be 80 years old, your heart would have been approximately, would have beaten approximately 3,363,840,000 times. OK, that's if you get to 80. So Prince Philip, who got to 99, his heart would have beaten over 4 billion, maybe between four and four and a half billion times. Can you imagine that? I mean, what a muscle, but what fragility, because it's only got to stop beating once. And at some point, our hearts will all stop beating. It's only got to stop beating once for that to be it, for that to be life. That's how fragile life is, is. And all of us face that. Every heartbeat, every breath, that is the fragility of life. Each one of us teeter on the edge of eternity, every moment of every day. And it's only God who in his grace. That God or that grace. Well, that reality nags people, doesn't it? It nags at us. It worries us. It brings fear. I mean, of course it does. And we try to block it out. I came across this um, quote from Russell Brand, and I loved it. You might know Russell Brand, the sort of comedian, commentator, actually very spiritual, you know, just open to things uh, guy. And he wrote this. He said, here in our glistening citadel of limitless reflecting screens, our phones, we live on the outside. Today, we may awaken and instantly and unthinkingly reach for the phone. Its glow reaching our eyes before the light of dawn. Its bulletins dart into our minds before even a moment of acknowledgement of this unbending and unending fact. You are going to die. I mean, it's quite sobering, isn't it? I remember hearing another quote from, from him that said something like, we laugh to distract ourselves from the inevitability of death. And I know this sounds quite heavy, but guys, this is because there's medicine. We've got to look at the sickness before we can give the medicine. And Hebrews is honest about the reality of the human condition, that without hope, without an answer, then we will be those who all their lives are held in slavery by our fear of death. So let's get on to the good news. What is the answer to this fear? Well, it's a Sunday school answer, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus is the answer. He's always the answer. But more specifically, his death, his resurrection are the answer. How? What have they done? What has happened that means we can live free lives, free of fear? Well, the scriptures say this, he too shared in their humanity, our humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of the one who holds the power of death. So just remember, the Bible tells us that there's something wrong with the world, doesn't it? We know that from looking around. What is wrong with the world? Sin is wrong with the world, the Bible tells us. And through sin, death 
entered the world. God's judgment came upon that sin and death entered the world. God said to Adam, you can eat from any tree you like in the whole forest of trees, but just don't eat from this one tree. If you eat from that one tree, you will surely die. Guess what Adam does? Eats from that one tree with Eve and death comes into the world. It establishes the pattern and the fact that the punishment for sin is death. So now death is in the world and sin is in the world and death is the is the wages for sin but we can't avoid singing sinning singing i wish we could sing uh soon but that's the challenge we all face because someone has to die for our sin that's just the way it is and it should be us right my sin i should die for my own sin i do my stuff i should suffer the punishment you do your stuff you should suffer the same death is the consequence Death is uh, the salary, the wages for sin. But here comes the good news, because Jesus came to take our place. He takes the punishment we deserve. He dies our death. He, to quote Hebrews here, he disarms the enemy, the devil, the one who accuses us before God, saying they're guilty, punish them, you know, declare death over them. God in Jesus disarms and disempowers the enemy, the accuser. And Jesus came to pay our bill. Imagine you go for a night out, a lovely meal with all your friends, and then suddenly you're left with the bill. And there's no way you can pay it. For some reason, it's billions of pounds. You can't afford it. Well, Jesus picks up the tab. He pays your bill, my bill. Um, he does and achieves what we can't and couldn't do for ourselves. This is what the cross has done. And it was always God's plan right from the start to rescue us this way through the cross. Because right there in Genesis 3, God says this when he's cursing the snake. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And on the cross, the enemy's head was crushed. The, the devil was defeated, was disempowered. But at the same time, he bruised the heel of Jesus. Jesus really did die. He was buried. But he rose again. I mean, that sounds good, right? It sounds great news that Jesus' death pays the price and sets us free. But the question we must face is, how would we know that it's worked, that the, that the cross has worked, that it's been affected? effective that it's removed sin that as verse 17 says that it has made atonement for the sins of the people how would we know that the crucifixion of christ has achieved that for us and that it's delivered us from all our ongoing fear in this life because god's anger comes against sin and all we know is that we one day will face that god and he'll be angry and he will pour out judgment on us that's what we're facing how do we know that we're okay. How do we know that the cross and the death of Jesus worked? Well, folks, this is where the resurrection comes in. The resurrection is the answer. That's why the theologian N.T. Wright, previous Bishop of Durham, wrote this. He said, the resurrection is not the reversal of a defeat. When you look at it, it looks like Jesus has lost, doesn't it? When he gets arrested, tried, uh, flogged, and then strung up on a cross, that looks like defeat. Most of the time, that's what defeat looks like. It looks like Jesus has lost. But N.T. Wright says the resurrection is not the reversal of a defeat, but the manifestation of a victory. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus shows us that the cross really worked, that Jesus' sacrifice of atonement for your sin, for my sin, was accepted by God Almighty, which means we can be forgiven of our sin, that our sins have been paid for, that God's righteous anger and judgment has been satisfied and spent by being poured out on Jesus. And friends, that is good news because what do we fear when we think of death? What do we fear ultimately? We fear God's judgment and we fear separation from him. We fear an eternity without him in hell. How do we know we've avoided that? We know it because of the resurrection. 
because the resurrection proves that everything Jesus said is true. All of his promises are yes and amen. We can be forgiven. We can have relationship with God. We can come home. And it points to the wonderful future that is for all believers, all followers of Jesus Christ, a new heavens and a new earth that we saw in our last series looking at the creed, where in this new heavens and new earth, there won't be any more tears or pain or suffering or death. There won't be any more funerals, guys. There's not going to be a need for any more coffins. There won't be grief. There won't be loss. There will just be joy. And that truth, my friends, because of the resurrection, it breaks the power of the fear of death and our slavery to it, breaks that power here and now. Jesus truly has freed those who all their lives, he's freed us who all of our lives had been held in slavery by the fear of death. Alleluia. Isn't that good news? That is the gospel, my friends. But just as I come into land, what does this mean for us concretely today? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that there is no grief or pain when it comes to death in this life. We saw that yesterday, didn't we, with the, the Queen sitting alone, uh, socially distancing, having to from others in her grief, in her loss, as her beloved Philip lay there in that coffin, gone from this life, that she will see him no more, be with him no more. And seeing royalty sharing in the grief and pain of so many, so many thousands in this nation, not to mention millions around the world at this time on the back of this year, sharing that pain, that grief, that loss is real, folks. Death is real. It does sting. The serpent does bruise the heel of Christ. And he bruises us still today. And we carry that wound, the reality of death and all that it means. The sadness that we all go through when we lose someone we love. Because even the resurrection of Jesus, knowing he's alive today and that we'll be with him forever, even that doesn't mean that that person is still in the room. The queen would still have had tea and supper without her beloved Philip, would have gone up to bed, gone to sleep without her beloved husband, her strength and stay. So friends, the resurrection of Jesus does not mean that death doesn't hurt. It also doesn't mean that we get to live recklessly just because we know that the future is secure, that, we, you know, and everything goes wrong. We go home to be with our father in heaven, you know, beyond this life of the everlasting arms. It doesn't mean that we live recklessly here and now. I love to ski. Perhaps you're a skier. It doesn't mean that you just see a, a bit of a cliff coming up the edge of a slope. And you think, oh, that looks fun. I'm going to just rock it and ski over that without checking what's the other side. It doesn't mean you're reckless with your life or that you drive around the countryside roads 100 miles an hour, not knowing what's coming around the blind corner. No, we honour God by taking care of our lives, by being safe, not taking unnecessary risks, not speeding away or wishing our death upon ourselves just because of what's coming next. God alone will call us home when he's ready. So the resurrection doesn't mean we live recklessly, but it does mean this. It does mean that we will live free, free from slavery to the fear of death, free from the fear of what's to come, the judgment we might think we're facing. Guys, the good news is Jesus has taken that judgment on himself. There's nothing left to fear for the Christian. Death is just a gateway, the gateway to the next life and eternity with God Almighty. We know this, we have this blessing because we've heard and received God's message of good news in Jesus, that he came to find us and rescue us. He came to bring us home. He came to redeem sons and daughters. Our reading today started with um, referring in verse 14 to, since the children have flesh and blood, 
the children. That's you and me. It's referring to us as God's children. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power. God himself took on flesh, became one of us to redeem us. But if you go back a few verses to verse uh, 10, we read this. This is what God has achieved for us in Jesus. It says, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Who's that? That is you. That is me. God in Christ has brought us to glory, to eternal life. In doing that, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And now get this, both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, us, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them, to call us brothers and sisters. Wow. Did you hear that, folks? Jesus is not ashamed to call you and me his brothers and sisters which mean which means we share the same heavenly father god is our father he loves us he came to redeem us and rescue us and save us and deliver us from all of our fears he did this by sending our brother jesus jesus came and experienced everything we do in order to set us free now, I want to land on this final story, because when when I was at school, when I was about 10 years old and I was an annoying little so and so, um, some pals of mine, believe it or not, they were actually friends, three or four of them. But I think I would ticked them off or annoyed them by doing something. And they took me down the end of this corridor as a boarding school. We're out of sight of the teachers. And I think they wanted to rough me up a bit or like tell me what's what. And they sort of grabbed me and spun me around. And they tried to trip me up. And, you know, sort of beat beat me up in a very sort of gentle way, which didn't quite work. Their attempt to trip me failed. But there were four of them. And anyway, I was like, oh, that's a bit shaken up. And I went off to find my brother. And my brother was basically the, the king of the school at that point. He was the golden boy. He was captain of, you know, all the sports, cricket, rugby, football, you know. And uh, everyone was in awe of him. And he was my brother, my big brother. So I went off and you know what I did? I went and found him and I said, come with me, these guys, my friends. And I am genuinely friends with them now. I don't know what they were doing. I don't, it's quite hard to square this story and help it make sense to you. It sounds odd, but you know what kids can be like. But I went and got my brother and I brought him over. And my brother came amongst them, sort of like Aslan the lion amongst a pack of hyenas. And he sort of like pinned one against the wall and sort of like clipped one around the ear. And was like, what are you doing? And he warned them and he just saw them off. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, you know, like from behind at the safety of his uh, his shoulder. Um, I went and got my big brother when I was in trouble, when I was being beaten up metaphorically. Didn't quite happen. But that's what it's like, guys. With death, our great enemy. Death is beating us up. It's beating up the world. It's beating up humanity. And one day it will beat up you and me as well. So what did God do? God sent Jesus, his one and only son, our big brother, to come and beat up death for us, to come and set us free. And friends, that is the difference the resurrection makes to our lives. Because Jesus's resurrection sets us free from the fear, the consequence and the ultimate pain and sting of death. Because he's ultimately had the last word. So in a world and a society that seeks to run away, seeks to block it out, seeks to pretend death is not a thing and even seeks to tell us that our faith is irrelevant. Don't believe a word of it. As long as death is still around, the good news of Jesus will always be relevant. Because in the message of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus, we hear of a God who raises the dead. 
and will one day raise you and me as well. Amen. Amen.